Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes and this is your 163rd video cast, 153rd podcast for the week ending December 1st, 2022. I uh, hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. I have a lot to be grateful for, uh, uh, very much so. Uh, the audience listening to this podcast video cast every week, it's been an incredible three years. And I've just gotten to meet so many incredible people and make wonderful friends uh, all over. As a matter of fact, uh, obviously over the summer, I got to visit one in uh, in Whitefish, Montana. And uh, that was a wonderful time with my family. Uh, and then uh, this week, I uh, had a wonderful dinner with Philip Vasiliou. Uh, if you remember from the Chandler Brothers story, they turned $10 million into $5 billion over two decades. And Philip oversees uh, all the investment decisions for uh, that permanent pool of capital. And uh, we've, you know, just shared great ideas, had a wonderful time. Uh, and then today uh, I got to meet with uh, two great folks. I uh, want to thank uh, Chris and Brian for coming in. They, they, they're with a, a, a huge, well-known uh, energy family out of out of Dallas and uh, really had a great conversation. So I, I always say, guys, you just have no idea who's listening to this podcast. It's just an incredible group uh, that we've attracted. In those two meals, uh, it was probably over ten billion dollars of assets represented. I, I would say I'm this I'm I was the smallest uh, AUM at the table uh, uh, by by uh, orders of magnitude, but nonetheless, they're just great people. Great sharing of ideas, great friendships developed uh, over the last three years. Very grateful and very excited to see uh, what's to come. So, um, so that's that. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank uh, Mitch Hawk uh, and Zoltan Saranyi for having me on Benzinga. We're going to go into that one. For, for some reason, that's just always incredibly popular. Every time I talk to Mitch, everyone loves it, gets great reviews. And I think it's, you know, Mitch is very puts people at ease and asks really great questions. And uh, uh, so we're going to play that because that really encompasses my my view on everything that's going on. And, and we probably covered, you know, I don't know, 35 subjects in 15 minutes. So that's going to be part of this later on, but we've got a lot more to get to. Also want to thank Zen Sams and uh, Megan Thompson for having me on uh, 710 WOR radio. That's a major a station in in New York, and I think it, it uh, syndicates uh, nationwide. Has a lot of uh, the major political uh, commentators, uh, and uh, she has a show on Saturday nights. I was able to join. That's iHeartRadio. So thanks for that. And then want to thank uh, Banvi Sacha and Menaz Yasmin for including me in their article on Reuters the other day. Uh, and this was our Thanksgiving. We we kind of have a tradition. We go into our place on Bryant Park in the city, and the girls see the parade. Sometimes we watch it from from uh, uh, the warmth. And other years, it's nice like it was. And we went down. And uh, this is Mimi with uh, Lucky. And uh, look, Lucky not looking so lucky there. I think she wants to go back into the apartment. And that's Annabelle with. Pepper, the newest edition. We bought Pepper for Lucky because we felt guilty, you know, when we weren't there. Lucky was all by herself. So they get along just as well as uh, Mimi and Annabelle, which are best of friends. And we're really blessed in that regard. Uh, then uh, this was them on the carousel in Bryant Park uh, having a blast. And, you know, you could see they're getting bigger and bigger. Those of you who've been with me for the last few years and uh, swimming like, well, they had a week off of swimming uh and uh that's very very unusual uh usually only happens in august for a little vacation but uh uh i think they, they it was a nice recharge and this is lucky uh was done with the cold she wanted to watch it from from our place there overlooking that's the salesforce tower if you know the area and then to the right of that is uh bank of america and this reflection uh off the the window here is the bryant park hotel next door so it was right in all the action we could see all the floats and it wasn't a windy day which was fun then we went to this special installation on fifth avenue called wonderland dreams by alexa mead and alexa is a really unique uh artist uh, it's just a cool uh, uh situation where the whole entire place is painted you can kind of see in the background she's very very creative interesting 
Uh, if you have kids or grandkids or uh, anything, it's right on Fifth Avenue and I think 43rd Street. You can just look it up, Wonderland Dreams by Alexa Mead. And she's, uh, the girls were now uh, recorded yesterday in her, that's them painting ornaments. They're going to be in her commercial, which she's running on, I guess, Instagram and Facebook. It's like a video commercial. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then we went to this uh, a color thing. I don't know what it was called. Color, fa color factory. And uh, that's us dancing in part one of the parts of the tour. It was uh, a lot of fun. You could see the girls are all happy dancing. I, I look confused uh, in that aspect of my life. Dancing's never been my thing. Then back in Connecticut, the Grinch came to visit in the Grinch Mobile. And uh, that's perfect because our article of the week is the Grinch is canceled. And this was the most low energy Grinch I've ever seen in my life. And I guess it was prescient because uh, I think the Grinch got knocked out by Powell this week. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, moving forward. So um, this is from Warren Buffett. Long ago, Ben Graham taught me that price is what you pay and value is what you get. Whether you're talking about socks or stocks, I like buying quality merchandise when it's marked down. That's Warren Buffett. And, uh, uh, and, and the second quote of the day, which we're going to spend a little time on, opportunities come in frequently when it rains gold, put out the bucket, not the thimble. And I've been talking about the emerging markets trade being the trade of the next couple of years. Obviously, China is the biggest weight and we just have to wait for the dollar to start to come in. The dollar is now coming in and, uh, and these stocks are starting to take off and it'll be more fits and starts and, until we get to fair and, uh, fully valued and, and then start to lay some off. But, um, uh, the game is beginning and, and I can't help, you know, I, I usually never go over 20% or at 22% on BABA, you know, but I can't help but sit up at night saying like, gosh, I should, I should be 60% because this is going to be, you know, and, and we won't because there are disciplines and, and everything else. And like, you know, sometimes it's the things that you don't know that you don't know, but, um, it, we, we've got plenty of exposure. We're excited about it. Um, but you know, <laughs> this is one of those rare situations and we'll show you some some of the data that we're looking at that leads us to that conclusion but it's one of those generational type of type of setups and we talked about that with um with mitch so we'll, we'll cover that i want to just quickly get into the s p 500 because we've been one of the few uh bullish voices in september and october uh and i think we're we're making some nice headway here uh, and, and people are still skeptical, which is the exact sentiment cycle. We've covered this many times. But if you look at this sentiment cycle, I think we're somewhere either here in discouragement and we're getting a rally and then we'll get a pullback before we go straight up. Or we've already done this and then we just had the back test and we're somewhere here. So I'm not sure if we're here or if we're, we're here. Um, this would be the 1982 model, which we've talked about. The S&P in the worst scenario. By the way, the other thing that's so important is everyone is saying that because the yield curve has reinverted. Remember, it inverted a couple of years ago before the pandemic, signaled that we got a recession, and then it redipped. So everyone's saying, well, you have to have a recession because if the yield curve inverts, you have to have a recession. But if you look at 1982, uh, which is the closest crazy inflation period with massive rate hikes accelerating. Um, the S&P dropped 27% peak to trough. We dropped 25 and changed peak, peak to trough. So that was a discounting and this has been a discounting uh, of the pain to come. And the minute Volcker made the shift in October 1982 from keep at it to May shift tactics, 100% of the gains were recouped in 100% of the losses were recouped in four months. Uh, I don't know if Wednesday was that shift in tactics, but it certainly was a soft shift for certain. And and I think there are enough people off sides that, that this could continue pushing higher or it'll be something more like this where we'll have, you know, a little more grinding, not new lows uh, and then go parabolic when everyone least expects it. Everyone is now, here's consensus. And if you haven't heard this by now, just turn on the TV. This is where everyone is. Everyone is calling this crazy three break putt that will, okay, you know, before they all said, there's no way we're going up. Now that we've gone up, opinion follows trend. Now everyone says, oh, we'll rally into the end of the year, but then next year we're going to make new lows. And why are they saying that? Because they're attached to the recency bias of 2008, bottomed in March, the recency bias of the pandemic, bottomed in March, 
Um, and, and, and when everyone's attached to that is when you absolutely don't get it. And the maximum pain would be if you keep drawing up while earnings go down. And we're going to cover the same chart that we've covered for the last five weeks from JP Morgan with the six scenarios that show the stock market bottom six to 12 months before earnings bottom. So everyone that's calling for earnings to trough at 200 six months from now, if history is any guide, six for six, hundred percent, uh, then the market would have already bottomed. And that's been our base case. Uh, whether we, you know, go back and do one of these or not, I, I think we've done it. But, uh, you know, I'll just show you here. So keep this picture in mind. Unfortunately, I can't show them side by side. Uh, but keep that picture in mind. Straight down, up, fake out, and then straight up when everyone least expects it. Straight down, up, fake out, and then potentially straight up when, when everyone least expects it. So, um, but you say, how can we possibly do that? Earnings are going to go down. The multiple's already too high. And that's how markets bottom at high multiples, not low multiples. The multiple is going to get higher because what's going to happen is earnings are going to come down a little bit more. The stock market is going to go up and people are going to say, this market is crazy. It's trading at 30 times. And then all of a sudden, you're going to see 2024 numbers start to matter. And all of a sudden, when you look forward, you're going to be back to a 15 times multiple. You already had the 10-year yield back down to 3.58 3, 5, today, I think it went down to. Uh, we're going to look at that in just a second. So the other thing you keep, keep in mind going into year end, do you think anyone gets paid when you have a put call to ratio this high? I mean, this is every single time it gets this elevated. Everyone's buying insurance uh, after, again, the house already burned down in October. And guess what? Bottom 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 i'm you know i'll call out the years as i'm calling for those pe people listening at the podcast the more people i get to meet in person that that listen to this the more they tell me whether they listen to podcasts or watch it i think a lot of people listen to it while they do other stuff but they listen on youtube so when i cover a chart they can pull the phone out of their pocket and look at the chart and and get the full full flavor of everything that's going on uh uh 2016 2015 2012, 2011. We're going to look at credit spreads in the context of 2011 too because there's a keen similarity. Bottom line is when there's this much insurance out and they've sold this much premium, you can be assured that is not getting paid out. Uh, thank you, sir. I have another. Uh, it's all gonzo. So uh, a note that uh, Philip sent over to me from Howard Marks I found very, very helpful. Um, and, and this was the one thing that I've been talking about uh, for some time and, and um Howard mentioned it. It said a news item that has gotten a lot of attention recently concerned the internal performance review of Fidelity accounts to determine which type of investors received the best returns between 2003 and 2013. The customer account audit revealed that the best investors were either dead or inactive. <laughs> the people who switched jobs and forgot about an old 401k leaving the current options in place or the people who died and the assets were frozen while the estate handled the assets. Um, so, uh, you know, that was very important. And uh, the point that he's making is uh, what we've continually said. I think most people would uh, be for, more successful if they focused less on the day-to-day -day, uh, and, and uh, macro and instead worked hard to gain superior insight concerning the outlook for fundamentals over a multi-year periods in the future. They should... One, study companies and securities assessing things such as their earning potential. Buy the ones that can be purchased at attractive prices relative to their potential. Hold them as long as the company's earnings outlook and attractiveness of the price remain intact and make changes only when those things can't be reconfirmed or when something better comes along. And this has been kind of the crux of our thesis consistently over and over and over. So moving right along, um, this is from Seth Golden. I thought this was pretty cool. From Canaccord Genuity, technicals are fungible, but we have not seen investor sentiment this poor since the 1990 recession. This is blood in the street we're buying. Now, uh, it's nice that they're saying that and, and their data points to it. Uh, the key is where were they, uh, you know, in late September and uh, early October, uh, you know, when everyone was under the bunker and we were saying, guys, if you're not buying it at, at, when these things are pointing at, at these extremes, then you're in the wrong business. Like just hang it up and stick it in an index fund because that was the time to be in the market buying like crazy. Uh, now we're up, you know, some 15% off the lows. Uh, but I think we're still going to push higher because that's max pain. Uh, but this, this just shows the level of extreme if the put call didn't kind of also signal that as well. 
Another one from Seth, uh, after spending more than 150 days below the 200 day moving average, it closed above it on November 30th. This is a study from Schaefer's. Uh, informed such a bullish feed of strength holds positive forward returns 92% of the time of six and 12 months later. The average return uh, six months later is 12%. And uh, this is for, and the average return for 12 months is 18%. So this is also in line with the post uh, midterm election year cycle, post negative year returns, et cetera, et cetera. Everything's pointing to that high teens, low 20s. Uh, and this is the key. These are the key charts I'm looking at every day. The 10-year yield is down from 423 to now 352. This is took out the October low. That is huge news. Next, U.S. dollar rolling over from 114. Uh, this is the Dixie uh, index basket down to 104 and change. Uh, this is critical for emerging markets. And finally, for um, uh, this is the high yield um, junk bond spread. This is huge because um, I was thinking about, you know, if you remember when I started talking about Cooper Standard, the idea was sparked at a conversation with my friend in Malta, Tiho. Uh, we were talking about Charlie Munger and the Tenneco trade came up from 2001. And um, uh, Munger bought, he read an article in Barron's and he bought Tenneco. You know, their bonds were trading down to like 30 cents. Uh, and there was a huge risk that they were going to go bankrupt because they had like, I think they had like $1.5 billion of debt. Uh, I think lower revenues than Cooper Standard has, and their uh, weighted cost of capital was even higher. I mean, it was it was grim. And he bought it, he bought ten million dollars of stock somewhere down here. Now look at their credit spreads. It was eleven hundred twenty basis points uh, compared to today. peaked peaked in the pandemic at a thousand eighty seven. Our recent peak in twenty twenty two was only 5.599, 5.99, and now that's dropped down to 4.55. It's rolling over. And um, so basically, he put in 10 million here, uh, and um, over the next year, they got refinanced. The stock shot up. He made um, like an eight-bagger on that. He turned 10 million into 80 million. He gave the 80 million to Li Lu, and Li Lu turned it into 500 over the next five years. So two chess moves and a half a billion dollars. Um, I think we're going to have much more than an eight bagger over time. Uh, we saw the uh, transaction support agreement that has to get done in December. Powell made that a lot more likely, uh, which is which is promising, not guaranteed, of course. But we've covered this before. Uh, you have the earthquake and then an aftershock. Earthquake, after uh, earthquake, aftershock, and this reminds me a lot more of 2011 than it does of 2009 or 2001. Everyone's been looking at 2001 with recency bias with tech. I don't think that's it at all because if you look at the earnings power of FANG, it's a completely different ballgame. Certainly the non-earning companies, they're, you know that, that game is over because capital has a cost. When capital has no cost, you always get malinvestment, whether it was housing in the early 2000s, uh, whether it was uh, tech in the late, uh, late, two, late 1990s, uh, or today it's crypto and uh, S coins and was largely it, uh, as well as uh, non-earning pipe dreams, SPACs, uh, and um, uh, companies that uh, with big, big on promises, small on profits. Uh, their 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 days are done for the most part. Because um, when capital has a cost, people demand cash flow, uh, and that's when stock pickers a a absolutely thrive. But uh, you know, heart attack, aftershock, and market keeps going. Heart attack, aftershock. I think we're, I think we're more like 11 and 12 as far, as it relates to the credit market. And I think they're opening. And a lot of banks are hitting the window. We put out an article, posted an article this week, speaking as much. Uh, so that's what happened with Tenneco. Uh, and and we're we're um, constructive that we can see a similar type of outcome with uh, with uh, with Cooper. And then rather than giving it to Lilu, give it to myself <laughs> and, uh, and and hopefully two chess moves. Uh, all right. So, um, all right. Don't know why that is there. Next. Um, we covered this, but 
you can't see it here. This is the yield curve inversion, the 210. And the, it, if you look back to 80 and 82, uh, by the time you got the second dip recession, the the second dip inversion, the recession was already over. And I've continued to say we had a technical recession the first half of the year. Whether Nyber acknowledges that or not uh, remains to be seen. But um, um, just because there's a double dip, we, we had that recession. It does not necessarily guarantee that you're going to have another recession. What people are stuck on, again, is recency bias, looking at inversion, COVID, inversion, great financial crisis, inversion, tech wreck, but they're not looking at the most comparable, which was 1982, S&P down 27%. Uh, Volcker, while inflation is still 7%, by the way, says we may shift tactics, shifts from keep at it to we may shift tactics, which is kind of what um, Powell did with the slowdown and, you know, boom, we were off to the races. Uh, inversion be damned. Uh, we never look back is really what it comes down to. And, and I could see that scenario playing out. Uh, we Look, amateurs deal in absolutes. Professionals deal in probabilities. I, I, I mean, everything, if the facts change, we change our mind and we, and we stay flexible. But I like having the non-consensus view because uh, that's where the money is made. The key is made, having the non-consensus view and being right. And sooner or later, uh, we wind up in that in that boat. And, uh, and that's why uh, we follow Warren Buffett's uh, maxim that if you're smart, you don't need leverage. And if you're dumb, you shouldn't use leverage. <laughs> we don't use leverage. And, and that's why time arbitrage works to our advantage. Because once we know what we own, if we get caught up in short-term noise and volatility, we just use that as opportunity to add more. We trade out pawns, get more queens. Uh, and then when the tide turns and the emotions turn because the underlying business has continued to grow and be solid or it's temporary impaired and we know why it's going to revert back to nor normal production, um, you know, we, we wind up better off on, on the hockey stick and, and this time will be no different. So uh, here are 10 reasons why the U.S. won't be hit by a recession according to Goldman Sachs. So they have one side of the bank say that we're going to have that triple break putt and we're going to hell. And then they have another side of the bank to cover their you know what saying that there's going to be no recession. So, um, but it's always worth reading all the, all the facts and uh, uh, the key to intelligence is being able to hold two inconsistent thoughts at the same time, conflicting thoughts uh, and take it all in and, and be open to uh, both sides of every argument and, and always invert, uh, always look to, to disprove your thesis versus trying to prove it. So, 10 reasons to be confident about the economy, labor market is cooling, uh, layoffs have been relatively small and confined to the technology sector, uh, positive inflation adjusted wage growth of 2.5, 2 percentage drop in core inflation next year, long run inflation expectations are in check, you see all the inflation numbers we've covered 100 times, and <clears throat> they see positive growth in GDP for both 2023 and 2024, which again points back to what I've been thinking in, is that we already had the recession in Q1 and Q2 and actually Q3 if you back out one-time energy products. So that would be similar to the 1982 thesis. Um, and then by the time he said may shift tactics, we were off to the races and everyone else was worried about earnings declining, which they probably did continue to decline for another six months, but the market already discounted that. Market's a discounting mechanism. So can't emphasize this. This is high level stuff, uh, guys and girls. I, I, I know it sounds simple, but you know, just turn on the TV. Very few professionals understand this uh, uh, because you know they they just either it's just you got to look at the empirical data. That's that's really what it comes down to, uh, and you know it can always change. You always have to be flexible, but you play your odds, and that's that's what the game's all about. Um, Alzheimer's breakthrough is boost for Biogen. Eli Lilly, despite side effect concerns. This is big for the industry. Once you start to get these big breakthroughs, you get fear of loss, huge investment. We love the long-term thesis on biotech. That's going to be another home run, multi-bagger over the, even though it's a basket, uh, that'll make us a lot of money over the next two or three years, just like the 2016 to 18 tightening cycle uh, and over and over and over. Junk bonds rally as investors speculate inflation has peaked. This is key for Cooper Standard because not only will they get this done, but you look at the 10-year yield now at 3.5, uh, they could probably refinance it a year from now when their pick is done, which is even better. So like, uh, and they still keep the tax asset, which is another exciting thing. So 
Uh, even if they don't refinance, I, I think the deal that they've laid out uh, that they got to complete in December uh, is just phenomenal. I think it's and I think it's become a much better deal in the last two weeks for the people buying it, able to take down 13 and a half percent yield in a business that's going to generate cash like it's going out of style uh, as the as the environment normalizes. And now the inventories are coming in. And if you turn on the TV, you're seeing more of 2.9 percent APR dealer financing. This is exciting. That means the inventories are coming in. They want to move cars. The volumes are going. The demand is there from two years back backlog. Um, that is constructive news, and that's a normalized environment. So uh, here are the flows into junk yield. The more you see these flows, the more those that OIS spread is going to compress and come in, just like in 11 and 12. Uh, the aftershock. Uh, it's it's unbelievable, by the way, that Tenneco was able to refinance. I mean, with 1120 on the OIS spread, that's that's just bananas. We're at less than half that. We're almost at a third of that. Um, and um, you wouldn't know it. You get caught up and, and you lose this historical perspective and you're like, oh, my God, credit markets. Are they going to get it done? It's like, yeah, they're going to get it done. I mean, look, look at this. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, I mean, if you actually this is hysterical. Look at this. Look at this. It's it's all relative, ladies and gentlemen. We're like at the low end, pretty much, with a few exceptions. We're near at the low end of the last. With with all the commotion, we're at the low end. There's way more above this line than there is below this line uh, in high yield credit spreads over the last 25 years. We just lose perspective when you have so much of this for so long. Um, you know, this is this is a good environment. Uh, and, and it just got a lot better in the last couple of weeks. All right, uh, moving right along onto the China stuff. Um, okay, so this is this is key. Opinion follows trend. So, you know, all the same people writing negative stuff when when the price was negative are now trying to find positive stuff to justify to understand why there's been a forty percent rally off off the lows in the last four weeks, and you had the record record months in Hong Kong and Chinese equities uh, with 50, you know Alibaba fifty percent off of its um, uh, washout lows in in October in just the last few weeks, and what they come up with is look at this headline. Super rare signal suggests Hong Kong stock market has hit rock bottom. Super rare signal. They're looking at the RSI. This is like kindergarten technical analyst school. Um, <laughs> it, it, anyway, I, it, I, I use it all, by the way. But I joke, you know, there was this guy. I, I put out the article this morning, the Grinch. Uh, the Grinch is canceled, right? And this this guy on Twitter replies to it because uh, the Dow was down 400 points for for two minutes this morning, and he replies, "Looks like the Grinch is still in town." And you know, I just said, "You know, patience, cowboy. It's a long month." And um, and and I was tempted to say to him because he sent a picture of the S and P with silly lines drawn on it. And I was tempted to say, "Did you know that we fundamental analysts actually invented?" the CMT designation just to create liquidity to get in and out of our positions from folks like you. <laughs> but I restrained myself. Uh, no, look, there's value. We use technical analysis just to help with entry and exit points. And, you know, but as far as it being predictive, like, you know, come on, folks. Uh, so so this magical. Super rare secret signal called an RSI. Uh, which is amateur hour uh, is is showing us a crossover. That said, uh, it is super rare, and uh, and if you were buying when it was uh, at extremes like this, you made a lot of money. So um, it makes perfect sense. Why why wouldn't you pay attention to it? Um, nonetheless, there we are with the super rare signal. Now everyone's trying to justify why did why did these stocks go up 30, 40, 50 percent in weeks? Why? Because the dollar went down. That's exactly what we've been saying was going to happen. The commercials are always early. The commercials are always right. Uh, and sure enough, you had a little pivot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, China investors look for a turning point after $370 billion rally. Opinion follows trend. You're going to see more of it. I mean, wait till Bob is over $100. You're going to get people on the TV. Uh, number one, you're going to get the ones that are super negative trying to drive it down because they're like, holy cow, I just missed 40 points. Um, and they're pissed. 
and they're the ones that sold in the hole and now they've missed 40 points so they got to talk it down and then you're going to get the ones that you know after a huge 50 percent move uh are going to start chasing it up and then you're going to get a you're going to get a fake out and then it'll you know it'll it'll take them out at a loss and then it'll run run back up again and rip their face off it's just psychology over and over and over so catching the big trends identifying catalyst for sustained moves is critical so they have the price moving in and then they attach a story uh reopening bets are now the new narrative uh but at the end of the day it's all about the dollar and uh that stuff was going to wear out on its own one way or another now now fortunately uh g has a little urgency because people are protesting in the streets and like bob chapek of uh, Disney, when I said a week before Iger came in, if you can go back and look at the look at the tape, I said either Chapek's going to make huge cuts or he's going to get cut himself. Sure enough, the next Friday, he was cut himself. And the same thing's going to happen with Xi Jinping. And we've been saying that eventually people can only take so much. So either he pivots hard on this, which it seems like he has this week, uh, or or he's 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 going to lose his power. You know, one way or another, it's going to be over. I mean, the people are going to, you know, you got... 500 million, you know, educated middle class people with a slow economy locked up like animals in their houses. They're not going to take it anymore. People can only take so much. And I think the the breaking point, besides that fire in the apartment building that people were locked in, uh, was uh, they watched the World Cup for the first few games and said, holy cow, the rest of the world is out having fun, not wearing masks. And we're locked in like animals. Uh, our government is screwing us. And, and that is critical. So then what they did was they edited out all of the stands and just had fuzzy faces so people couldn't see that the other but everyone knows and and the cat's out of the bag and they've got to make the pivot and they're doing the pivot and that's why you're seeing follow through but uh so more of the central bank uh boost stimulus to aid covid hit economy uh china cuts reserve requirement by 25 basis points boosts economy with 70 billion of fresh liquidity China pledges $162 billion in credit to developers, shares rally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now on to the U.S. Uh, Tom Lee talking about the, the headwinds of 2022 now becoming tailwinds starting now. Inflation, obviously, the Russia-Ukraine war is in stasis, but we're getting the oil anyway uh, through India and China. Uh, that's why you're seeing crude down. Uh, food price index is set to be negative year on year. Goods prices tanking. Ten years now, he said from 4.2 to 3.7 is now 3.5. Uh, Fed is becoming more predictable. Uh, he, he was really a pivot. We're going to cover a little bit in a minute. Uh, China's easing. He says possibly easing. Now they are easing. C CEO confidence is bottoming. It's already bottomed, and expensive stocks have already been derated. So all the conditions are there. Uh, Caxon reported that Beijing has set, set hard KPIs for local government by end of January. 90% of the people aged over 80 who meet the health criteria must fully be vaccinated and receive booster shots. The current number is 66%. China is about to start a massive vaccine campaign. So they've been trying to protect the elderly. Now they're just going to, they're saying, you're taking this vaccine whether you want it or not. And once they get them all vaccinated, the doors are open and they're just going to say, and they've already been creating the narrative. They say this variant is not deadly. It's like the flu. So once they get all the older people uh, vaccinated, it's game on. And the market's going to, it's starting to sniff that out, but it's really going to sniff it out in coming weeks. And even though the cases have gone up, although they started to come down a little bit, it's, it, it's irrelevant now. It's over. Xi got the message. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he came very damn close to a Tiananmen Square issue. Um, Macau finally draws a winning hand. They got all their licenses. Uh, no change there. These are all doubles in the N+. Plus. You know, we've got some Melco. Uh, win in uh, Vegas Sands will work. They're, they're all home runs. And I covered that actually with Money Mitch, which you're going to hear in just a second. Uh, COVID lockdown, China COVID unrest boils over as citizens defy lockdown efforts. So they're rebelling. This is huge. And I've been talking about this. So the government saw Alibaba as a, a threat. Now the government desperately needs Alibaba. China enlists Alibaba and Tencent in fight against U.S. chip sanctions. So I've been talking about their, their cloud chips, their AI chips, etc. So now Alibaba and Tencent are going to be major, major players in the chip game for China. The government desperately needs them. One hand washes another. 
and off to the races. So what was a tailwind is now a headwind. The government has to, uh, uh, what was a headwind is now a tailwind. The government's got to help, help them, support them. And, and what do they need to invest in R&D? They need profits and they need growth and they need consumption. And the government now wants all of that. China loosens grip on COVID exactly three years after the first ever case. Official says COVID fight in new phase. Concessions emerge. First documented COVID patients. Okay, so up to December 1st, I guess, of 2019. Um, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Emerging market stocks and bond stage powerful rebound rally. Um, best month for emerging market debt in 24 years. So this is a big deal. And why? We covered this last week. The last shall be first. Look, emerging markets were last in 2018. By 2020, then they were like fourth, then they were second. They were last uh, last year. They moved up barely this year. Next year, they're going to be at the top of the list. I, I can say that with my eyes closed. Look at 2015. They were uh, second to last. By 2017, they were on top. Uh, 2008, they were on the bottom. 2009, they were on the top. 2011, they were on the bottom. 2012, they were second from the third from the top. Uh, 2000, they were on the bottom. 2003, they were on the top. So here we go. Uh, merging markets uh, and REITs, the, the last shall be first. REITs is just a bond trade. You say, well, real estate, are you out of your mind? This is not, you know, the the, the five houses, uh, uh, you know, in your neighborhood in Palm Beach that have gone up 80% in the last five years. Uh, REITs are a different game. They trade on, even if their price goes down, their rent should be going up, uh, depending on the asset type. Uh, so if you're picking the right ones, uh, these are going to make money and they're already getting a bid as are uh, long bonds, which we've been talking about for weeks. The Grinch has been canceled. Stock market and sentiment results on Wednesday. Fed chair Powell shifted his messaging just enough to cancel the Grinch from stealing Christmas this year. In his prepared speech on Wednesday, he made the following statements, which eased market participants jittery sentiment over the last few days. Monetary policy affects the economy and inflation with uncertain lags and the full effects of our rapid tightening so far are yet to be felt. Thus, it makes sense to moderate the pace of our rate increases as we approach the level of restraint that will be sufficient to bring inflation down. The time for moderating the pace of rate increases may come as soon as the December meeting. Emergency over. So um, this is key. And I think this is when we look back uh, uh, with hindsight vision, I think we'll find that this was the May shift tactics moment. And, um, and and I think people are going to be uh, very surprised with what happens over the next few months uh, in a positive way. Then at the conference, he made press conference, he made two unexpected statements. I sent out a tweet. I said, please no one tell him this time that the market's gone up. Because <laughs> if you remember the last conference, some guy from the Associated Press said, how do you feel about the stock market going up? <coughs> and he spent the next 15 minutes talking it down and absolutely destroying it. So I think it was like a 1200 point move that day. Uh, from uh, green to red, a lot of red. So uh, one, I don't want to over tighten, quote unquote. Up until now, the Fed has consistently implied that they would lean towards over tightening. And two, it's, quote, not appropriate to execute some shock and awe strategy to crash the economy and clean up after afterwards. They were on track to do this. Uh, uh, they may have already done it, by the way. They're kind of right at the edge here. They might have pulled it off the cliff with this pivot this week. Uh, it's nice to see they're finally recognizing the impact of their impressive tightening and acknowledging the lagged impact. The market abruptly rallied on the news led by China tech, biotech, U.S. tech, and semiconductors. We've covered the opportunity in all of these unloved groups in recent weeks, and this was the shift that caused a bid. We expect to see continued follow through in fits and starts through year end. Some data points to pay attention to moving forward to. This is like the BOA. They're the managers, the most underweight tech. The last four times you bought it, you made money. Uh, here's Goldman hedge funds are now underweight TMT, uh, stocks by negative 5.2 versus SPX, the most underweight level in the history of our prime brokerage data back to 2016. So TMT is Infotech bus communication services, think Fang, <coughs> uh, Ryan Dietrich, S and P closed above the 200 day moving average for the first time in 17, in seven months, looking at the past 13 times since 1950. Uh, it was beneath the trend line for six months or more and closed above. Showed only once did it move back to new lows. The average was 18.8%. Again, uh, high teens to low 20s just a year later. And uh, higher 12 out of 13 times. 
This is the Atlanta Fed now pointing to GDP growth of 4.3% in Q4. Economic surprise index has turned up. History suggests this could lead to upward revisions and forward earnings estimates. No one's talking about upward earnings estimates. Everyone's talking about them coming down. They've come down 8% so far. Everyone's calling for another 20%. This would be the surprise of the century. And guess what's the catalyst that no one's talking about? Is the dollar being weak is a monster tailwind and is going to add, you know, if it's come down 10%, you add another 10% of earnings to the S&P, you're back up at 240, uh, 250. No one's got that in their forward looking windshield. Everyone's in the rear view mirror. And I don't even think that needs to happen. I think earnings can come down a little bit and the market will still rally and really cause maximum uh effery as we like to say you fill in the missing vowels uh and and really catch people more off sides than they already are uh this is from seth golden a uh, healthy reminder years where real gdp fell but s p rose there's that pesky 1982 year once again which we've been constantly referring back to don't let the absolute return detract from the overall path so um even if you did get that negative next year or we wind up negative I mean, it doesn't look like we're going to be negative with uh, with uh, Q4, et cetera. But it, again, the market's a discounting mechanism. So the S&P can be up monster in these years looking forward to 2024, et cetera. Looking at all times the S&P finished red during a midterm year uh, showed the next year was higher the past eight times, uh, not to mention a very impressive 24.6% average gain the next year. So everything's pointing to the high teams, the low 20s next year. Everyone's positioning for another down another new low the triple break putt we we missed the 15 percent rally off the october lows when we were saying it was going to 3200 remember that everyone was saying 3200 2900 instead we got a 15 percent rally off the lows everyone's now saying we're going to get the triple break putt up and then down to new lows well we'll probably go up and then we keep going up because everyone's going to skip this or chase it and then get short put all that premium in the market, they ain't getting paid, pushes higher, they got a chase, and that's when they take them out to the woodshed. So um, we're not trying to predict anything. We're just telling you how the psychology of the market works. It's designed to cause the most pain to the most amount of people at any point in time. And once you understand that, you just look at it. Where's everyone crowded on the boat and take the other side? Um, this is from Jim Paulson over at Luthold. Three historic peaks of inflation uh point to market bottoms each of the past seven inflation cycles after the annual inflation peaked which did over the summer by the way the bottom of the stock market was already in ergo here we go 42 47 51 74 70 80 90 on and on uh here's sentiment trader selling pressure is exhausted this is corporate insider sells and the last time it was this low, 2019, you rallied for a couple of years. 2016, you rallied for a couple of years. 2012, you rallied for four years. So one of the best strategists on the street, Marco Kalanovic, who I like and admire a lot of JP Morgan, uh, he's been bullish all year. And unfortunately, he literally threw in the towel and fin finally capitulated and went bearish exactly one hour before Powell spoke. He literally put out his note at 12.30 p.m. Powell was out at 1.30 Market watch picked it up at 130. And um uh but he's a smart guy. He'll pivot and he'll get right back on the on the train. Um but you know, usually that happens at the exact kind of uh, sentiment capitulation low. And uh, you know, um he's one of the best in the business though, so don't count him out. He'll be back stronger than ever. On Tuesday, I joined Mitch Hawk, Money Mitch on Benzinga to discuss the stock market end of year outlook, the best trades for 2023, 2024, US dollar emerging markets, Fed inflation, tech clearance sale, Black Friday, China casinos, oil, Volcker, rail strike, and my favorite, thumb suckers. So we're going to listen to that. Thanks to Mitch. Uh, we did that. Pay special attention to the commentary on tech and emerging markets in this segment. So we're going to go to the segment right now. All right, getting out of United Health, we can talk all day about the markets, but there's nothing like going towards, of course, the experts. So coming up, Thomas Hayes, chairman and managing member of Great Hill Capital. I want to give you guys a little bit of some insight that you guys can check out and learn from my man, Thomas. I appreciate when he always comes on. And one of the things 
that he has. He has this great site that you guys can check out, hedgefundtips.com. Let's go ahead and bring Thomas on. All right. How are we doing, Tom? It's good to have you back on the show. Welcome back. Doing, doing great, Mitch. Great to be with you. I rem- remember the last time I was on was under much different conditions. It was uh, October 13th. The S&P was at 3491. And you kind of cornered me at the end of the interview. And you said, Tom, where are we going to be by the end of the year? And it was, a, I think the Dow was down like five or 700 points that day. I said, Mitch, you know, that's not my game, but, I, but I'll give you a range. I think we're going to be at uh, 4,100 to 4,250 by the end of the year. So we're getting close and I, I stand yeah. behind that and, uh, and things are moving in the right direction. But it, it wasn't an easy call back then. Yeah, it never is easy, right? I always say when we're looking out in time, I mean, it's just going to be more perspective on the macro headwinds. Are those going to be affecting us, right? And always, it's just a good perspective just to have. And then, like always, we got to look towards the price action. It looks like we've had that kind of rally. Looks like some of the bulls started getting control. We got some good supporting economic data. Now, it needs to continue. Now, from China right now, we're getting mixed signals. It seems like we're getting some news or noise, whichever it may be. What do you see going on here right now, Tom? Yeah, so I spend a lot of time on China. I do think that's going to be one of the best trades in the coming years. And the most important reason why is the dollar. I I know I've been on with you a couple of times. I say, watch the dollar, watch the dollar, watch the dollar. Well, sure enough, in the last couple of months, the dollar started rolling over materially. And uh, China and emerging markets have started to get a small bid. Uh, I think you're going to see that follow through as we turn the co- turn the calendar. As far as the protests, I think the protests are, are really a positive situation because if you look at the Hang Seng Index and the Shanghai Composite, I went back to uh, April 15th of 1989 to June 4th of 1989, which were the protests and then the uh, Tiananmen Square incident. Uh, The next four years, uh, from 1990 to 1994, the Hang Seng was up 380 some odd percent, uh, and the Shanghai Composite was up 1100 (laughs) percent. So uh, for people saying this is the beginning of the end, I think this is the beginning of the beginning. Uh, In this case, it does seem now that Xi has secured his power uh, domestically, that he'll be somewhat more responsive to these protests, and we saw as much this morning. Uh, They started coming out and we started to see leakage where they were preparing press conferences to say the current variant is more like the seasonal flu. Uh, Not many people are dying. They're also now focused on vaccinating the elderly, which basically are sending the signals that they want to get the economy open. And they got to do a little bit of ignoring this and declare victory. They can say, look, when the variants were bad, we saved millions of lives, pat on our back. Uh, Now that it's like the flu, we have to get on with it. Uh, and those who are at risk get your, your vaccinations. They also have the new uh, nasal uh, vaccine, that uh, inhalable vaccine. Uh, that's a positive. So I, I think what you're going to see in, in coming weeks is uh, some more press releases that uh, things are moving back to normal. There was one small region I saw this morning that lifted some restrictions effective midnight. So they're, they're actually currently out of lockdown. Uh, and I think you're going to see more and more of that to come. Uh, There was a modest downtick in cases, but that's kind of immaterial at this point. I think the government recognizes they've largely lost control. And if they don't uh, uh, kind of bend here, they're going to break. Are you concerned with maybe potential problems continuing from kind of the tech war that I'm kind of seeing out there? It seems like, of course, uh, deglobalization seems to be a trend that we're starting to lean towards here and other countries. So do you feel that there's going to be a continued kind of tech battle there? Well, in the sense that uh, some of our chip providers will not be able to do business in China, there's there's certainly a risk of that. But I think, you know, as we look forward, I'm I'm starting to look for more opportunities outside the U.S. uh, that 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 will benefit from the falling dollar. And and most of the large tech companies, you know, I like Alibaba. That's a long term investment (laughs) longer than I had anticipated. But uh, but, you know, that thing is going to it's going to work out over the next few years. So they're less dependent on the U.S. supplies. They have their cloud business. They have their retail business. And the minute that that the government pivots and blinks, which uh, it may have been last night, but certainly we'll see for sure in coming weeks. 
uh, th these businesses are going to do exceptionally well, provided this, the dollar stays weak and we start to see flows into emerging markets. You know, you look at the, you know, K-Web was down 80 percent. I mean, you know, it would be like saying if you could buy the Dow Jones in 1932, would you be interested after it crashed 80, 90 percent? If you didn't buy, you lost generational wealth opportunities. I, I think the same is the case for the highest quality Chinese businesses. And even if the government continues to screw things up in China, as, as they have for the last 12 to 18 months, consistently, repeatedly against their own self-interest, eventually the vaccine, eventually the, uh, the, the virus just dies out on its own, as it did in 1918 to 1920 with the Spanish flu, when there were no vaccines. Eventually, it just runs out of hosts. So, um, so, so we're, we're very constructive on that side. Uh, as far as U.S. tech, I think, I think you broach a very important point, Mitch. Uh, you know, U.S. managers, one of the data points I look at a lot is the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey. And one key tidbit this month that came out, which was about a week and a half ago, is that managers are the most underweight tech since 2008. So everyone's gotten on one side of the boat. No one wanted energy. No one wanted banks in 2020. Uh, after they're up, you know, 200, 300 percent, everyone wants them. And now no one wants tech. Well, if you had bought tech, the last four times that managers were this underweight, uh, you did exceptionally well, whether that was October 2008, August 2006, August 2004, or October 2002. So we do see a lot of specific discrete opportunity in that group. All right. And the next area that I want to go to is it seems like, you know, we're starting to see these casino stocks that have Macau exposure getting a nice lift. We yeah. saw the Macau licenses going through. How do you feel this is going to play out? Because it seems like, of course, if it's going to be more of that lockdown situation, might be a situation to see a turnaround. But if you feel that we're getting towards that reopening, do we have an opportunity with some of these casino plays? No question. I think I think if you look at Las Vegas Sands, which is now mostly Macau-based business, if yeah. you look at Wynn, uh, mostly Macau-based business, these are doubles and triples over the next three years. So I know your, your audience likes to do things very, very short term, uh, some mm -hmm. of them, but if you just step back and even if it's a pocket of your portfolio, be a little longer term, you know, be willing to double and triple your money with no effort. <laughs> and that's really, you know, what these opportunities are. I think when you look at LVS, even we own uh, Melco Crown, which is uh, more of more of a, uh, a Macau based uh, provider. Uh, you know, these things, the, the Asian culture is, is gambling in nature and, and the demand for these is going to come back in spades that you talk about pent up demand. We saw the, the travel numbers for Thanksgiving this year, finally, much higher than pre pandemic levels. We'll wait till you see the gambling numbers over the next 12 to 24 months in Macau and China as people finally get out of lockdown and they want to get back to their normal lives. So these are no brainers. The licenses were the last piece. Now we'll wait for them to come out and say, wait a second, I'll, you know, uh, COVID is like, you know, this variant is like the flu. Go about your business, take your vaccine, wear your mask. And uh, and these things could 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 really make a lot of money for investors over the next couple of years. Well, how did you see the holiday season starting off? It looks like we had a decent thir uh, Thanksgiving and Black Friday. Of course, another good Cyber Monday. Do you feel this will continue in the holiday season? Yeah, record Black Friday sales up 2.1%. Uh, I do think the consumer is relatively strong. You know, the Fed's doing everything to slow growth. And I think that's why we're in a holding pattern. Obviously, today we're waiting for Powell to speak tomorrow. We're waiting for the PCE inflation numbers. We're waiting for the jobs report on Friday and then the CPI uh, the day before the next Fed meeting. So, so that's kind of a governor. But I think on balance, you know, I can't go anywhere and, and restaurants aren't packed. So I, I think that... Uh, People, maybe they're running out of savings, but the average homeowner has $207,000 record home equity uh, across the country. That's not just on the coast. So when you think about uh, that wealth effect, when you think about their savings rates are still much higher, yes, they're coming down. Uh, I think people have spent two years of making sacrifices and they're like, I just want to live my life and I'll deal with the consequences later. Uh, and and, uh, and I think we're going to see more of that uh, going into Next year, uh, the key will be when unemployment starts to tick up above four and, and close to five. That'll probably be the peak for this cycle. Uh, that's when we'll see a little bit of pullback. But the market is a discounting mechanism. And I think the, the key thing that you want to keep in mind, Mitch, is you, you hear a lot of analysts out there saying, 
uh, well, you know, the market can have bottomed because earnings are going to come down another 10 or 20 percent from here. And there, there's consensus around that. And you have all these people calling triple triple break putts. Uh, we're going to rally into the we're, we're down and then we're going to rally into year end and then we're going to go down and then we're going to go up on you know April 1st. You know, and it's the most ridiculous nonsense that you've ever heard. If you look at the last number of cycles, uh, basically, whether it was 1957, 1974, 1982, 1990, 2009, or 2020, the stock market bottoms six to 12 months before earnings bottom. So if earnings are coming down another 10 or 20% in the next six months, that's not necessarily a reason to sell. That's a reason to, to potentially start adding high quality businesses that have been marked down because in every single case, by the time earnings had actually bottomed uh, in, those, in those six instances, the stock market, the S&P 500 had recovered most, if not all of, all of the losses, and in some cases was at new highs. So uh, that's just the way it works. And what people can't get their head around is, well, how that, how's that going to work? If earnings are at 230 for next year and they come down to 210 and we're back at you know 4,800 or, or 5,000, you're talking a, a 25 times, 30 times multiple. But that is how markets always bottom with a high multiple. And then they'll start to discount 2024 earnings, which will be much better. Uh, and, and that's what it's done. So we've had the 25% crash on the, on the basis of what's to come. Uh, and then we'll have the, the, the recovery and beyond on, on the basis of, the, of uh, looking out to 2024 once we turn the calendar. Now, of course, uh, it seems like I'm wondering about a relationship here. Of course, the Fed rate hikes with the dollar. Seems like they've been running side by side. Now, do you feel that this trend is going to continue or do you feel like it's going to split here, especially as the Fed has been said to potentially start slowing down the pace? Well, just like the equity markets are discounting mechanism, I think the dollar is starting to sniff that out. I think consensus is now 50 basis points in December. I mean, you know, one thing that I will, I do think 75 is off the table, but one thing I will say that no one's talking about is the possibility of 25, albeit it's extremely low probability. But if you've got extremely low inflation prints tomorrow, uh, a, a bad, which bad news is good news, jobs report on Friday, meaning a lot less jobs than expected, and a really low uh, CPI number the day before, it's not outside the realm of possibility they could only go 25. The market would be shocked by that. Um, but, but let's stick with consensus is at 50, and then the, next, the following meeting is 50 or 25, and then we're basically paused and they'll stay at those levels for a considerable amount of time. Uh, that, that sets the stage, you know, that move out of the emergency for emergency rate hikes of 75 basis points into 50 and 25. You know, Paul Volcker, it, it, it's very interesting. You know, everyone's worried about Powell because his, his hero is Paul Volcker. And he uses these famous three words, which was the title of uh, Volcker's book, uh, which was keep at it. OK, so he's going to keep at it and he's going to put as many people out of work as possible and not take into account the lagged effect. Although we saw in the minutes, they're now discussing the lagged effect of the policy. In October of 1982, Volcker made a simple change while inflation was still near 7%. And he shifted from keep at it to the, to the words may change tactics, may shift tactics. And the moment those three words came out of his mouth, within four months, 100% of the losses had been, been erased. Uh, and, and within another, uh, the next year, uh, we were 20, 20 some odd percent above new highs. So you have to keep in mind, like a little shift in tone could, could have a lot of impact on the market because as, as we continue to talk about, the market is a discounting mechanism. So I'd watch the language. You know, I think I'm with you. I think in the short term, he's going to keep that hawkish talk. He tends to overshoot on both sides. You were around yeah. in 2018 and saw the train wreck he caused uh, in December 2018. So I I'm not counting on him to deliver any uh, any presence under the tree. But uh, I think the market will start to sniff out as we as we move down. And the U.S. dollar, uh, once it sees that chain rate of change move from 75 to 50, knowing we're going to 25 and then pause, uh, that parabolic move is getting crushed. And I think it's going to continue to roll over. Definitely something that we'll be looking for. Will we get some actual 
disinflation, right? I mean, that could definitely exactly. help, right? Deflation is what we're looking for. Dollar coming down could definitely help that. Now, I did hear about, uh, of course, the, today, Speaker Pelosi saying that they're looking to have a, a bill down for trying to re- deal with the rail disputes. How do you feel about the situation? Is it going to have any kind of lasting effects here in the stock market? I doubt it. I think, look, this is a Democratic administration. You still have a Democratic Congress. They'll figure out a way to get it resolved. Uh, this is supposed to be a pro-union administration. So if they can't get it done, who can? Uh, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over that. I, I think that gets done before Christmas, uh, if not sooner. All right. Last thing, I le- saved the best for last. So definitely smash the like button. The latest on oil from Tom. I want to know, what do you see out there? It seems like oil is just hanging out here in the 70s. Can these oil stocks hang on with oil in the 70s? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, I think uh, the last uh, time or so, you know, you had me on talking about oil. Uh, look, I was bullish on oil in 2020. We shaved off earlier this year, maybe a little too early, but we made a lot of money. We didn't want to be pigs. Bulls make money, bears get, make money, uh, pigs get slaughtered. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm less interested. I, I would say if the equities come down uh, materially, we, we consider reloading for the next three year trend. But at these levels, we're, we're a lot less interested. We like to buy things when they're dislocated. Look, I could buy things like Warren Buffett, t- Taiwan Semiconductor got cut in half. Uh, you know, while everyone was sucking their thumbs waiting for China to invade Taiwan, Buffett swooped in. Uh, was greedy when other people were fearful, and he bought $4 billion of Taiwan Semiconductor. Amazon's cut in half, 50%. You think that business is going to do better or worse five years from now? Uh, Meta's down 75%. Disney's down 55%. Emerging markets are down 40%. K-Web's down 80%. I mean, take your pick. It's in, you know Wall Street's the only place in the world when they hold a clearance sale, no one shows up. And I got to tell you, you know, Cyber Monday may be over, but in terms of the stock market, there's still a lot of opportunity. Well, thank you. Like always, Tom Hayes, we'll definitely have you back on to maybe have a little bit of an outlook into 2023. Always love your insight. Appreciate you guys. And definitely check out the hedgefundtips.com. Appreciate you, Tom. Thanks, Mitch. Have a good one. Uh- and we're back. Uh, and here is the chart, which we've covered before. But this moves in cycle. The ratio of emerging markets to U.S. stocks is at its lowest level since 2001 over the last 12 years. Emerging markets is up 28%, while equities have more than quadrupled. U.S. equities have more than quadrupled. And this works in cycles. It's all a function of the dollar. And uh, and here's the trade. And when it rebounds, it rebounds hard. The last time, 88 to 94, emerging markets were up 600% versus the S&P up 133%. Uh, outperformance by 440 466. What's the narrative now? The only place to invest is in the U.S. Where is the boat crowded? And here we go. And that's why I sit up at night like I should have 60% of the assets in in China. Like literally. Anyway, we we got plenty of exposure. But this is going to be an awesome trade for the next three years, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 99 to 2010 emerging. So then, so so did 600 for, for those six years. Then it underperformed. Uh, then it outperformed uh, from 99 to 2010. It was up 392 versus the S&P was up 10% uh, from 1999 to 2010. Then you had 2010 to 2022. The emerging markets only did 28% and the S&P did 357. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to shift this sucker back and we're going to do another few hundred percent in emerging markets uh, while uh, S&P is going to be more subdued. Uh, for the general indices. So uh, that's our bet. And, uh, and, and um, we'll find ways to get even more exposure uh, sensibly and, and really ride this wave uh, over the next few years. Uh, that's, that's already starting to take off. Um, you know, by the way, I was talking, I don't know who it was. I, uh, yeah, I think it was, I think it was Philip. And I said, you know, I, it was Philip. I said, I do stay up at night. I feel like I should be 60% in emerging markets. I think about you know, look at the K Web. It is the Chinese Internet ETF. It's down. It was down peak to trough, eighty-one percent. Something like that has only happened a couple of times in history. It would be like buying tech in you know two thousand two or two thousand three after it had collapsed eighty ninety percent after the tech wreck. Or the only other equivalent that I can think of would be buying the Dow Jones Industrial Average in nineteen thirty two after it had crashed eighty or ninety percent in the Great Depression. I mean. 
How many times in a lifetime do you get an opportunity to participate in something like that and it's laid up and you can't give it away? And that's the sign of something truly awesome. And do we know that the, that the absolute bottom is in three weeks ago because we're up 40, 50% off the lows? We don't know that, but do, you know, it doesn't even matter. We're still a blip, a pimple on the, you know what, of what's possible over the next three to five years. So anyway, that's what keeps us up at night. We should have more exposure to emerging markets uh, and we'll figure that out, uh, how to do it. We've got quite a lot, but we got to figure out how to get more. Um, Okay, each month the Consumer Conference Board's Con Consumer Confidence Survey asks respondents whether they think stock prices will rise, fall, or stay the same for the next 12 months. Over the next, over 40%, okay, over 40% now expect prices to fall, stock market prices to fall, near its highest reading in over a decade and a sign of extreme pessimism. You just, again, look at what happens when people are this pessimistic. You get generational buy opportunities over and over and over. Uh, Long-term inflation, five-year inflation break-even is down to 241. That's that's basically, you know, Fed's at 2% inflation, give or take. I mean, that's that's crazy then. They should stop cutting right now, stop hiking right now because they got the lagged effect. This thing is going to get down to 2% over time in expectations. Actual is going to run above trend, as we've said consistently. Rent change month on month, the biggest month-on-month uh, -month decline. It's going to start to show up in CPI. And for the fourth consecutive weekly reminder, most analysts are calling for earnings to come down another 20% and are therefore bearish on the market or playing their triple break putt. History shows the stock market bottoms well before earnings. In most cases, the S&P 500 had recovered to new highs by the time earnings had bottomed six to 12 months later. 57, 74, 82, 90, 2009, 2020. Bottom of the stock market, bottom of earnings. 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 And what's the common denominator in every case by the time earnings have bottomed? The stock market is already at new highs or at least recovered most of their lows. And in some case at material new highs, 20, 20% above recent highs. Uh, the 82 one is, is mind boggling, which is the closest model. No one could see anything like that, but you'll be surprised things happen. Uh, so this is Zen Sam's check, check this out. She does a great show. Uh, also pay attention to the farm analogy I lay out. We're not going to play that now, uh, on why short-term volatility does not bother us and why growth and value are joined at the hip. Funny how history rhymes. One stock I spoke about with Zen was Disney. Here's what Warren Buffett had to say about it at a previous time. Uh, this quality franchise was out of favor. This is from 1966. He says, you didn't have to be a genius to know that the Walt Disney Company was worth more than $80 million. $17 million for the Pirates ride, it's unbelievable, but there it was. And the reason was, in 1966, people said, well, Mary Poppins is terrific this year, but they're not going to have another Mary Poppins next year, so earnings will be down. I don't care if earnings are down like that. You know you've still got Mary Poppins to throw out in seven more years, assuming kids squawk a little. I mean, there's no better system than to have something where essentially you get a new crop every seven years and you get to charge more each time. $80 million sigh. I went out to see Walt Disney. He'd never heard of me. I was 35 years old. We sat down and he told me the whole plan for the company. He couldn't have been a nicer guy. It was a joke. If he'd privately gone to some huge venture capitalist or some major American corporation, if he'd been a private company and said, quote, I want you to buy into this. This is a deal. They would have bought in based on a valuation of 300 to 400 million dollars. This is Alibaba. You couldn't sell Alibaba privately for 800 billion dollars. And it's trading at whatever it's trading at, 250 billion. It's going to be a trillion dollar plus. It's a no-brainer. It's three to five years. Ant Financial is going to control financial transactions. We own a third of that. And the cloud is going to dominate. They're just getting started. But the very fact that it was just sitting there in the market every day convinced people that $80 million was an appropriate valuation. Essentially, they, oh, by the way, 250, back out the 70 million, $70 billion of cash. I mean, it's, it's, it's hysterical. Essentially, they ignored it because it was so familiar. But that happens periodically on Wall Street. And back to the beginning, back to the future, what did we say? When it rains, rains gold. What did he say here? Opportunities come in frequently when it rains gold, put out the bucket, not the thimble. And that's why I will lay awake every night thinking, how can I get more exposure to this and be responsible about it? Because I think the next three to five years is going to be unbelievable uh, in this space. Leaving that aside, 
uh, China update on Sunday night. Uh, markets were cratering on uh, China, Hong Kong futures were down big uh, on the protests over the weekend. And I knew this was good news, not bad news, because either Chapek's going to cut or Chapek's going to get cut. Either Xi's going to wake up or Xi's going to be out. And uh, the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests and massacre ran from April 15th, 1989 to June 4th of 1989. It was a tragedy. Here's what happened to the Hang Seng Index over the next four years. It was up 378%. Uh, and then some wise guy said, well, uh, that's because, uh, you know, Hong Kong wasn't taken back by China yet. And uh, so, of course, they could do well. I said, oh, okay. Well, the Shanghai, okay, wise guy, the Shanghai Composite did even better. So uh, it was up 1,600% over the next two, uh, four years after Tiananmen Square. So uh, uh, Hong Kong was independent. They were up 378%. Uh, Shanghai Composite was not, and they were up 1,600%. Pick your poison, uh, and that's the game. So U.S. listed stocks in China capped biggest monthly gain after October route. Uh, November was the biggest month in history. Uh, glad we did that top up. We never go over 20. We we did that extra 2%, increased the position by 10%. At 61, I wish we had had 100% at 61, but uh, it really is not going to matter in the scheme of things uh, as we look out three to four years. This is this is a, this is exciting. Anyway, uh, Hong Kong's Hang Seng just had its best month since October 1998. Uh, since we posted these 18 points on Twitter during the October final capitulation flush to $58, Baba has rebounded 50% off the lows. You can go back over these 18 points. They're very important. A lot of it has to do with the dollar, uh, sentiment, et cetera, et cetera. Conditions are improving to create a playing field conducive to climb back to fair value and ultimately full valuation. There will be more fits and starts, but we are making progress. China loosens grip on COVID exactly three years after first ever case. Uh, COVID no longer dangerous to humans as it used to be. Official behind strict COVID lockdown softened stance. I'm just reading headlines. China enlists Alibaba and Tencent in fight against U.S. chip sanctions. We covered that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, acceleration of vaccines plan. Cooper standard, no change since the last comprehensive update. I would strongly suggest you review it here. We go into the breakdown of the new debt structure that they're proposing, uh, the earnings power, the estimated vehicle production industry-wide and what that means in terms of EPS and how we get to these um, uh, very constructive outlook moving forward to, to make the understatement of the year. Uh, now on to the short term. Again, nothing's a guarantee. You know, anything can happen, but uh, we, we feel uh, pretty secure in, in, in what we uh, understand about that situation. So uh, in this week's AAII sentiment survey, Sentiment ticked down 24.5. Bearish ticked up to, that's bullish down to 24.5. You can see that's like where you want to be a buyer, not a seller. Um, sentiment is still despondent for retail traders, investors. Uh, general sentiment, the CNN fear and greed compilation of seven indicators is, is uh, uh, accelerating. So, um, so there's something to be said. It's starting to repair after just being in the doldrums for, for a long time. And then the National Association of Active Investment Managers was at 60%. Um, let's see if that changed because they usually put it out on Thursday. Uh, that is a level that they're too underweight for this type of um, move. It tells us that they missed most of the 15%. And the 64.3, so no change. So they're going to get slammed into year end if they don't. Uh, start to bid. Uh, some earnings, consumer staples, top 30 weights. Uh, earnings are down 2%, top 30 weights for 2022 and 2023, 2.3%. These stocks are richly valued because everyone's been flocking to them for defense. They're getting overcrowded. Uh, when I see price up and earnings down, not interested. I like to see price down and earnings up. Uh, in this case, consumer discretionary, earnings are down uh 0.84 and 1.70. This is a very interesting area to us because you want to go to where the puck's going. Earnings, so everyone's chasing energy because they had good earnings. Backward looking, you want to look forward looking. Consumer discretion is going to have the highest earnings growth next year. You can't give them away. 35.8% earnings growth next year relative to the S&P, about 5.7%. 
followed by financials, industrials, communication services, all the stuff that people have thrown out uh, that we've been talking about, uh, tech, semiconductors selectively, uh, and different things will be opportunities. Energy is going to have the worst earnings next year, materials, uh, et cetera. So uh, skate to where the puck's going. Look at these names, Amazon we've been talking about. Listen to the Mitch thing if you didn't, uh, because I go through like six names that are just complete no-brainers. Um, anyway, so we like this stuff. And finally, uh, economic data for this week. Um, there were a couple important things that I wanted to just touch on. Consumer confidence came in slightly better than expected. That was nice to see. CB, uh, CB consumer confidence. Uh, and then core PCI, core, core PCE a little bit higher than expected, but, uh, GDP also higher than expected for Q3, um, at 4.3. And uh, what what was I wanting to cover here? Chicago PMI missed big. Uh, Jolt's still at 10.3 million, so that was strong. Big draw in crude. Um, okay, so continuing claims were elevated. That's good. We'll see the jobs report uh, tomorrow. That's actually a very important number. Uh, pay attention to, you know, I think at this stage, bad news is still good news. So expectations are for uh, 200,000 non-farm payrolls. Uh, last week, last month, let's see if that comes up. Oh, I can't do that. Otherwise, I'm going to move the whole thing. All right. Well. We want to see it coming below 200,000. That'll give Fed further cover. Remember, we said the Fed needed something to hang their hat on. They've been getting it. And we got more today. If you look at the uh, ISM manufacturing came in lower than expected. So that was a sign of weakness. And we also got the PCE price index, which the Fed looks at, was at 0.3%, uh, 30 basis points. It had expired it had been expected to be up 50 basis points or a half a percent month on month. Uh, instead, so, you know, that that's a big deal on an annualized basis. You're talking 6% versus 3.5%. Uh, and then the PCE year on year was up 6%. That was in line with expectations. But this month on month PCE was huge in uh, benefit for inflation number. Initial jobless claims were over 225. So we'll see the jobs report tomorrow. Uh, but things are generally pointing in. Some some numbers are still a little bit hot, but but the but the most important one came in really cool, uh, which is this PCE uh, price index. And uh, also the other one, uh, rather core PCE price index was two tenths of one percent versus three tenths of one percent, which is a key factor for the Fed. Uh, so all this stuff is giving the Fed cover to kind of chill out and let the lagged and variable effects kick in without driving the economy off the cliff. And with that said, I want to thank everyone uh, in the context of uh, post Thanksgiving. Very grateful for everyone, all my clients, all of our loyal listeners every single week uh, that, are, that are brand new or that have been with us for three years on this podcast video cast. Uh, let's keep continue to rock and roll onward and upward. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.